This week on the show, I'm rejoined by my friend Dr. Brett Sockled to give us the Evangelical Guide to Purgatory. If you're like me, as an evangelical, I was fascinated by purgatory because the idea that I could die in all my 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 sinfulness, my my grumpiness, my the things I'm hanging on to, I'm saved by Christ. But how could I die and then one one day and be waved into heaven the next? As if those sins that that personality I developed here as a curmudgeon just went away, and I was fit to live with Christ in the beauty of heaven. It didn't, as an evangelical, make a lot of sense to me. So I was attracted to the idea of, of some kind of purgatory. I couldn't put words to it. I didn't know what it was. But here we go. When I became Catholic, the doctrine of purgatory made a lot of sense. It was kind of that fit of the thing that I was looking for all along. Well, Dr. Brett Sockled, a Catholic himself, is here to explain it for all of us. For those listening who are evangelicals, watching who are new Catholics, wherever you might be, here is a fantastic guide to purgatory for those who have little to no clue what's going on and what we as Catholics believe. It's the Evangelical Guide to Purgatory. I hope you like it. Please watch and enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are listening on podcasts, thank you. Please do leave a rating and review if you can. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that helps to push the podcast out to new people, new listeners. And hey, we're on YouTube. If you want to watch the show as well, youtube.com slash the cordial Catholic to watch what you are listening to. Uh, friends, we're in for a treat this week. I am rejoined by Dr. Brett Sockold. He's going to talk to us, or tell us everything that we need to know about purgatory and just fill in all those gaps for us. <laughs> No he pressure. Is, no pressure. <laughs> None at all, Brett. He is the Archdiocesan Theologian for the Archdiocese of Regina up here in Canada, the co-host of the Thinking Faith podcast, and the author of a number of fine books, including uh, Transubstantiation, Theology, History, and Christian Unity, uh, for which he came on the show previously to talk about. It's a fantastic topic as well. And this week, talking about can Catholics and Evangelicals agree about purgatory and the Last Judgment? Uh, fantastic book, um, which you you wrote a little note in there to me. It said, uh, "Dear Dear Keith, enjoy," which I think means enjoy purgatory. So I appreciate that, Brett. Thank you for <laughs> that note. Thanks for being on the show. Welcome and hello. It's good to be back. Yeah, uh, you know the the saints say that the pain of purgatory is is sweet. So <laughs> so there is you know you can enjoy it kind of the way you can enjoy like. When a massage therapist finds the right spot and it like it hurts like heck, right? But you're like, please stick your elbow in harder. Like that's <laughs> that's how you enjoy purgatory. Oh gosh. That's okay, that's it. That's the podcast, because that's a there we are. <laughs> that's a, I think this whole thing is worth that, like, you know, that analogy right there. That's just that's fantastic. Uh Brett, the real reason why I want to have you back on the show, and this is a very Canadian thing, you'll appreciate this, is that last time I butchered your last name when I You got it say perfect it. this time. Well, I've been practicing in the shower for weeks now, <laughs> Brett. But I had to have you back on, not because this is a good book, it's an okay book, but because <laughs> I really felt bad about your last name the whole time. I felt bad and I had to have you back on as a Canadian. I couldn't let that sit, Brett. Yeah, well, when your last name is little, I mean <laughs> It's, yeah, it's pretty... you're, you're, yeah. You're not going to get payback in kind, so yeah, you yeah. do have to make reparation, yeah. and then there's another connection with our topic. So. That's perfect. You're 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 getting person. years off here. You read the book. You're you're correcting your mistakes in in this life. Yeah. So you're you're like chopping years off purgatory yeah, as yeah. we speak. That's great. Well, I appreciate the tarot voucher in the book that gives me you know ten <laughs> years off purgatory. That was a good idea putting that in the back. Right. You know, once yeah. You've, once you've read that's the book, worth the cover price alone, yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think so. Absolutely. Might get in trouble with some of the reformers, but they're they're long dead. So <laughs> what, are gonna, what are we gonna do? Okay, this is a this is a fantastic topic for for a discussion, and I really want to dig in here uh, deeply if we can. This was one of those things. Now, I. I I don't know about listeners to, to this show. They come from all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, some are non-Catholics, some are new Catholics, some are Catholics for a long time, and this is a topic that they can learn more about from that perspective. For me, this is one of those topics that long before my conversion really, really drew me in. I can remember reading C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce as an evangelical, and 
the, the, the picture of kind of the afterlife that, that he paints in, in that book resonated deeply with, with my kind of, I don't know, inborn understanding of what would happen when I die. Cause I never, and that of course is a very purgatorial kind of picture that he, that he paints famously in, in the great divorce. I never understood as an evangelical, what the belief system that I kind of inherited when I, when it was saved at say age 14 or so was this idea that when I die, you know, a, a switch is flipped and I meet Christ face to face in heaven. And I could never understand how me with my hangups, like my, my hurts, like my obnoxiousness, my, you know, my, these, these issues that I had to deal with or was dealing with as a, you know, as a Christian, I believed that I was forgiven of these, of these things as an evangelical Christian, but I still knew my personality that, that I had these things hanging on and I could never understand how if I were to die one day, a switch would be flipped and I would in the next moment, in the next breath, be okay in heaven seeing Jesus face to face. I was always like, what happens to those things? Like, do I, do I just like, is, is a wand waved over me and I somehow feel okay to fit in heaven? Because I felt like I, there was, there's, there was a, a massive gap there, you know, right, unless, right. My, unless my will is going to be bent or like superseded by God, how was I ever fit to like suddenly be okay with being dead and in heaven with just, I, I wasn't that holy. Like that never right. felt right to me. So when I discovered, like when I began to read from Catholic theology and I encountered this idea of purgatory, I was like, this is, this is the thing that I was back when I read the great divorce. This is the thing now in, in theological terms that I always felt was missing and made sense of just my lived experience of the Christian faith. Right. So, I don't know. I want to leave that there for you to comment on, and then we can dig into some of the the, the history and the whys and those things. But I, I don't know. Was I crazy? Like was well, that was the <laughs> right? So so I mean, what's interesting? I mean, my book is "Can Catholics and Evangelicals Agree?" So I went mm -hmm. looking to see what Protestants had said about these issues, and you're not alone. Like there's a number of Protestants who've made arguments either for purgatory explicitly, right? Like by name, you know, saying at the Reformation, yes, there were problems, but we shouldn't have thrown the baby out with the bathwater, yeah, yeah. that kind of argument. But other kind of arguments that don't necessarily name it, but but just describe something like it, you know, like like the uh, the great divorce that you describe, right? It doesn't, it doesn't say this is purgatory, but it describes a process. And the process is the process of sanctification, which you have some familiarity with in living the Christian life. And the problem, as, as you've articulated, I think is, is right. You don't experience sanctification as a kind of overruling of your freedom by magic. Yeah, yeah. You experience God actually engaging you in your freedom. And it doesn't feel right that at death, it, it would be done with a magic wand, that there would be some sense of continuity. In fact, there's an, an interesting uh, uh, Protestant argument that, that I read that I include in the book uh, that said, if it, if it was like a magic wand, you would have a legitimate question as to whether you could identify yourself with the person on the other end of the transformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you didn't, if your freedom was not engaged somehow in, in the sanctification, but it just sort of happened, um, would you, would you rightly say, yeah, I'm still that person? Uh, and, and the, 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 it was a rhetorical question that the, the author of the article I read said, well, no, like that there's a real problem with identity. If all of a sudden all of the things that, that impeded your, your holiness just evaporated without any engagement with your, your freedom. And that just doesn't seem like how the gospel works. And so one of the principles of eschatology, right? The study of the last things, whether it's heaven, hell or purgatory is that there are intimations of it in this life, right? Hell, hell, is something you can experience intimations of now. Yeah. If eternal separation from God is a possibility in eternity, it's only because we can already start that process now. And the same thing for heaven. If eternal unity with God is a possibility for eternity, we can get a glimpse of that and, and little experiences of that uh, now, you know, in mediated ways in time and space and history. And the same is true of the process of purgatory. It's just the process of sanctification, which all Christians believe in, uh, it sort of thought through to its logical conclusion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk a bit, a bit about the, the div 
I don't know, development is maybe the wrong word, but one of the common things that, that I would have certainly understood as an evangelical or thought I understood about purgatory is that this was this this medieval in, invention, right? This is where this the, the Catholic Church went up. Because the, the narrative, right, of course, would be that I understood whether it was it intentionally said or just in the air we breathe was the Catholic Church kind of went off the rails somewhere, right? Added these things to it, whether they're barnacles or what have you on this ship, that are, are different different metaphors you can use, but went off the rails somewhere. And, and purgatory was one of these things that, that took the Catholic Church off the rails. I love this quote you included in the introduction from the from um, I, the Anglican Church, right? And there, it's it's a fond thing vainly invented, like right a, from the Thirty Nine Articles. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's a great depiction of 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 what I maybe thought purgatory was before I began to look into it. Right? It's this, you know, it's, oh, it's 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 a wonderful idea, but but it's obviously invented, right? Like right. So talk about this because. That's where I think a lot of evangelicals think the origin of purgatory is, is in kind of the Middle Ages, but it's not. <laughs> right, so, right. So maybe well, walk so, us back a little bit in history. Yeah, I mean, we have we have a, a bunch of examples. Uh, transubstantiation is one. The Trinity is one of words that aren't in the Bible. That The words show up later in Christian history, and they have sort of antecedent roots in the fathers and in, in, in the Bible. And purgatory is one of these kind of words too, right? It, it doesn't show up that early. Um, and it's actually a little bit debated when it shows up, but it's, it's not even a patristic term, although there's tons of patristic imagery uh, around it. And there are, to, to give Protestants credit, there are elements of a doctrine of purgatory as it comes to be understood and expressed in the Middle Ages that are a little misleading or, or unbiblical, right? So there are, um, there's sort of magical beliefs attached to, to certain s- sorts of things, uh, certain devotions. Uh, and certainly, you know, at the time of the Reformation, the way the doctrine was being abused uh, as a moneymaker uh, is obviously problematic. Now, yeah. you can't just straightforwardly say, therefore the Catholic in- church invented it to make money. Uh, that's the, the historical record just doesn't bear that out. But a Catholic has to admit that it was used that way, right? But but the real roots of of the the doctrine are are ancient and biblical. And I would say there's two there's two roots. One is a sort of theological question, and it's the question you just put at the at the opening of the the show, which is. So what happens to imperfect Christians when they die? Like, how does that work? Uh, so that was one part of the development. And there's there's biblical uh, language that might be, uh, or biblical um, language, but also like concepts and, and stories that might apply there. So you have, you know, not getting out till the last penny is paid, or you have testing by fire and, and you know, some things will be burnt up, but some things will survive, but only as through fire. So you have these sort of biblical um, touchstones uh, to think about this problem, even though it's not always super clear in the scriptural context that they're being applied to that very precise question. Um, But then you also have a practice of the Christian faithful, which was universal from the beginning. And it's the practice of prayer for the dead. Yeah. Uh, and Christians just always did this and they were, it's, it's not real. The, the new Testament is, is really vague on this. Uh, in the old Testament, of course, we have Maccabees where, where we have prayer for the dead, but of course that's not in Protestant Bible. So that doesn't, that doesn't help you. Right. So, um, so the new Testament is quite vague on this point. Um, we do, we do have some sense of a relationship with those who are, who are, who have gone before us in the life of faith, right? The cloud of witnesses, for, for instance. Uh, but, it's, but it's not very specific on prayer for the dead and how, how it works. What we have instead is a universal Christian practice that is not condemned. Uh, it, it's No one ever thinks in the patristic period that the New Testament requires Christians stop praying for the dead. Um, can there be superstitions associated with, with this kind of practice? Absolutely. But, but the practice itself is universal and unquestioned. And so then that it, these two things come together. The question of what happens to the imperfectly sanctified Christian at death 
and what does prayer for the dead mean and how does it work? Those two things come together over centuries and various metaphors and, and writers and ideas and images eventually coalesce into a doctrine of purgatory, which uh, which is, from an official point of view, is quite modest. The church's official position does not go into all these details. What has been dogmatically defined is like, it exists and you should pray for the people there. Yeah. Like that, That's almost the whole thing, right? Um, it's, it's a very sort of circumspect kind of doctrine. Whenever we talk about eschatology, we need to be aware that we're always in the realm of, of using images and analogies to talk about things that are beyond us, right? So the church tends to be circumspect uh, on those kinds of things. But but that's that's the roots. And you can go back and read, you know, Gregory of Nyssa, for example, has um, language that looks remarkably like a contemporary doctrine of purgatory in like the fourth century or third century. Is it third or four, whatever it is? Um, and interestingly, right before the Reformation, uh, so to skip a few centuries, Catherine of Genoa, a, a mystic and a saint from medieval Italy, has this beautiful articulation of purgatory that if it had been the predominant strain at the time of the Reformation, probably would not have, the, the doctrine wouldn't have caused near the trouble it did. Uh, and her, she has, this is a biblical image, of course, but her, her controlling metaphor is gold that's tested in a fire. And, uh, and she says, the thing is, you're always in the fire. Um, but gold, once it's been purified, once it's 24 carats, right, all the dross is gone, it no longer suffers in fire. And, and it's beautiful because it, then it's the encounter with the living God it isn't destructive of the human person, but it is purifying. But once the purification is complete, you, you, you don't really move on to some new stage or anything like that. You just, you can properly enjoy God now, right? Uh, like like gold in a fire, you you don't suffer, you know? Uh, but, but you need to be sort of acclimatized, <laughs> you know, uh, because you're not fit for this. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Uh, a couple of things that jump out at me. The, f the first is the idea, and I don't know where I, where I first encountered this, but somewhere along the line, someone I had done on the show or something I read, just I just got the idea that, okay, if if more Protestants had the Old Testament canon that we as Catholics have, you know, kind of the, the larger canon, the more original canon, if I, I dare something so controversial, how much easier some of these things would be to understand because you 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 see Preso dead prefigured in Maccabees in the Old Testament, so then of course it makes sense that that practice was then practiced by by Christians in in the New Testament in those times right because it's it's right there you remove you remove the context of those those books from the modern Protestant canon and it it feels so dis disjointed where there'd be more of a bridge there if that we're still there in sacred scripture, right? I think that's interesting that that, that right. practice, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the question the question of the canon is is a complicated one, and I mean, how much Maccabees was rejected f for this very reason? Yeah, uh, yeah. Is, is an interesting question. I mean, it, it couldn't have been only that reason because it was part of a group of books that existed in 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 one version of the Old Testament, not in another. So it wasn't just sort of plucked out. Uh, you know, the way that Luther tried to pluck James out, for instance. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, if it was there, I mean, at, at, at minimum, even, even if it's not canon, right? Even if you don't accept it as canon, at minimum, it is witness to Jewish practice. Yeah, right. Right. right? Uh, even if it's just a historical account and not the word of God, it's a witness to a Jewish practice that's not condemned. We don't have a record of of it being condemned. Jesus never tells people to stop. You know, the Jews of his time are praying for the dead. Jesus doesn't seem, you know, fit to, to criticize that practice. Um, so, I mean, at minimum, you have that, right? You can agree on it as a historical text, but certainly if it was considered canon, then you'd have another layer to that for sure. Yeah. And I love that you underscore how widespread it was in, in the early church. Right? All kinds of things are condemned. You know, some, so I think of Irenaeus, you know, his, the bulk of his writing is condemning these different things that were, he, that were heresies, right? So there's lots of examples of the early Christian writers condemning things in the early church. You know, Paul, a lot of Paul's letters are, are to churches saying, stop doing this, do this instead. Right, right, right. A lot of these things, and here's something that we have from, from the earliest times that was being done, 
right? With with the understanding that these that these souls, like nobody was going around praying for souls they knew were were in heaven or hell, right? The idea at this time is these souls must be somewhere where we can pray for them, right? Well, yeah. So this is this is where the two right the two roots of the of the doctrine, yeah, yeah. the theological question and the practice of prayer for the dead, start to intersect. So so the question becomes: If you're praying for the dead, well, what does that mean? What is it? What does it achieve? Can it can it do any good? And and that implies that their fate isn't sealed. Now there's now there's a way in which it is, right? People, there's a misunderstanding of the doctrine of purgatory, which is like the it's still an open question whether you're saved. So you go to purgatory and you might end up in heaven or hell after that, you know, if if things go well for you or not. <laughs> and and that's right. We need to we need to clarify that that purgatory is for the saved. It's it's people who are going to heaven. That's the end. If if you've made it this far, you're gonna get there. Uh, you know, all, all, the only question is is what's it gonna take to get you there? And now you can have a kind of um, what's the word I want? You can have a sort of oversimplified sort of mathematical version that you have to pay for a certain amount of something, right? So these sins are worth these many years in purgatory. And I think that's ultimately more confusing than clarifying. You can see why people came to these images. It's important to recognize those images are not official church teaching, right? It, you know, that certain sins take a certain amount of years. In fact, years becomes a meaningless term. Uh, like we, we don't really have good language for talking about how time works uh, between here and eternity, right? Um, but but there seems to be some process implied, right? That people are actually going through something and that you can actually help them. You're not going to change the destiny of someone's soul, heaven or hell, by praying for them in purgatory. But you can somehow help them in the process of purification, right? And so if we think about this, if... If 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 the basic concept is is the doctrine of sanctification extended, well, how do we help each other grow in sanctity in this life? Yeah. Well, we we pray for each other is is one way, um, and and how does that that work? Well, it doesn't work by magically changing other people, and it doesn't work by getting God to overrule their freedom. So that can't be what we're doing when we're praying for the dead in purgatory either. Now, when you pray for something, a lot of it is left sort of to the mystery of God's working. You don't actually always get to find out how God works these things out. So what I'm about to say, I don't mean to, I don't mean that it's an exclusive. It's the one and only way that prayer for the dead works. Uh, I want to leave open the possibility that God uses other things, but I want to share something that will give us at least an inkling that it's not magic and it's not God o overruling his justice or, or like cutting corners for people like, oh, you're not really sanctified yet, but Keith prayed for you and his word counts for a lot with me. So we're going to let you in a little early, right? Like it, it can't be a short circuiting of the process. It actually has to be a support and enabling of the process. So for example, um, here's a personal story. My father-in-law did not like my first book. Did not like it. <laughs> uh, wanted me to actually retract it uh, and change it. And now that was actually not possible. And I didn't agree with the critique anyways. But I mean, he, he strongly disliked the book, right? Uh, so uh, he passed away. We went to his um, home before the funeral. And I stumbled across his copy of the book. And it's all marked up with his criticisms of it. <laughs> Jeez. Well, can, I mean, can you imagine reading this is a man whose funeral you're going to go to in like literally like an hour and you're sitting in his basement reading his copy of your book. And it is like, it's, it's not pleasant. Right. <laughs> and I'm able in that moment to pray for him with a kind of freedom that I did not have if he was still alive, I'll tell you. And I was able to offer a kind of forgiveness uh, and, and a kind of understanding that I wasn't able to offer in this life. I didn't even have full knowledge. I mean, I had some knowledge, but, yeah, yeah. um, and, and then I was able to go pray at his funeral mass for him. And 
offer a kind of reconciliation from my end. I don't know what he's doing on his end. That's between him and God, right? But from my end, I'm able to offer something. And I know from my experience of, of difficult human relations in this life, that if someone offers you an olive branch, uh, it frees you. And so when we pray for the dead who we knew, right? The people we knew who we had less than perfect relationships with, we're literally freeing them to experience God's grace, right? And now it's not that not that we can hold them captive indefinitely, right? If we refuse to do that, God's grace is still going to get there. But But we know from our experience in this life that if someone offers you that, it's easier for God's grace to work. And so I think that that maybe gives us a picture of like prayer for the dead isn't magic, right? It's not asking God to short circuit the process. It's a participation in the process because we can actually build one another up in holiness or not. Yeah, I know that's a fantastic example. Would that, it's a little it's a little personal. I hope my mother-in-law doesn't listen to this, but anyway. <laughs> I'm sure she hasn't heard of this show. Yeah. Yeah, but then I post it on my social media. So what well, are you gonna do? Well, good luck, Brent. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wonder then how you would apply that to people you don't know, because one of the lovely practices, my wife, you know, we've been having kids for a while, and so it's been a while since we've been able to go out, say uh, you know, in in the evening and do something by ourselves or, or whatnot. And she went to this beautiful graveside service in a graveyard with, this, with uh, it wasn't the mass it was a kind of prayer service or something that happened there it was and it was beautiful i couldn't go i had to watch the kids at home and i was i i was probably serving some penance here feeling you know sorry for myself and wishing i could be there with her but it was this idea that this group of, this group of Catholics with the priest went and prayed in, in a graveyard for the souls in, in purgatory and for the people in that graveyard who had passed away. So how do we apply this practice to people we don't know and can't really like reconcile with in the way that you're describing right. there? They haven't, hadn't read our books and, and poorly reviewed them. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, part of the answer is, you know, in God's providence, uh, God can use our prayers in ways that we can't imagine. Right. I think that, I mean, that's the bigger context. But actually, I mean, one beautiful thing that Catholics do is we pray for those who have no one to pray for them. Yeah. Right? You've heard that language, right? Where Catholics say we, we pray for those who have no one to pray for them. Well, imagine, imagine being that lonely person. Yeah. And now these people say, I don't know you from Adam. But you are my brother or sister in Christ, and that's enough for me to offer this prayer, this reparation, this suffering, this whatever, uh, on your behalf, right? I mean, I can imagine that also freeing a person to receive God's grace in an analogous way. I mean, this same, you know, in this life, if you help a stranger, yeah, uh, does that communicate God's grace or not? Well, of course it does, right? And so. Uh, it, it, now you're not going to reconcile with a stranger the way you reconcile with a person who that you have a history with, um, but can you offer things to a stranger that are that are um, that transmit God's God's grace? I, absolutely, absolutely. That's that's the Christian life in in this life. We should be doing it to, for the living. So uh, if if our conviction is that death is not something that separates those who are one in Christ, uh, then if we can do it for the living, we can do it for the dead. Yeah, yeah. I was going to actually ask you that next question, but the right, this again was one of those, those concepts that we have, or I have as an evangelical, and lots of evangelicals have this concept, but it seems so unbiblical, the idea that, okay, if I were to die you know, on the spot here, Brett, <laughs> make for good, good, for good podcast. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'm suddenly cut off from you entirely, even though we're brothers in Christ like that. Right. Again, like the idea of, of my, I, I die and I can see Christ next moment in heaven and I'm fit to do that. That never sat right with me knowing my own self. It also didn't sit right with me that I could, I could die and I'd be so cut off from you that there's just no connection. I thought, well, isn't the veil torn? Like, aren't we all in Christ. So that never made sense to me as an evangelical. If you logically, if you, if you think it through, it doesn't, it doesn't sit right. right. So what and, you're saying here really tracks and makes a lot of sense. That actually, you can still, you can still pray for me that I would be sped on the way to, to seeing Christ and get 
ready to do that. Right. Yeah. C.S. So in The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis doesn't go into these details, uh, but we know uh, that he he how he thought about these things uh, in a way that supports The Great Divorce by some letters he wrote. It, it's collected in a book called Letters to Malcolm. And in Letters to Malcolm, he he says, like, it is so natural and spontaneous to pray for the dead, uh, to, to consider yourself to have some communion with them that's not broken by death, uh, that I would need overwhelming arguments against it. it it's just it's just like and, and I mean, just consider like losing a parent right, yeah, or yeah. a child that you would that you would think that you had no communion with them anymore seems atheistic practically you know what i mean like yeah. it doesn't feel christian it feels materialist you know um and so there's this 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 sort of deep inclination that if it were not christian we should have heard about that right <laughs> like paul should have told the people to cut it out you know if that was not something in keeping with a christian view of of the afterlife and and those kinds of questions right so it's it, it is this deeply human Thing. And even when 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 missionaries, let's say, encounter cultures that have ancestor worship, um, well, there's things about that, of course, that that Christianity is going to want to critique. But there's also things about that that Christianity is going to want to build on, right? When Christianity in, encounters other cultures, it's not only a matter of critique, but it's a matter of engagement with with the good and true things. Yeah, Paul does this. At, at, you know, uh, in in Ephesus, he he critiques the the trinket sellers at the temple, you know, and, and causes the big uproar on the one hand. But on the other hand, then he goes to Athens and says, oh, I see you're very pious people here. You know, let me let me tell you about this unknown God that I found this altar to, right? He does both. He critiques the culture, but he also affirms what they get right. And I think when we encounter cultures that, that, that have forms of ancestor worship, there's something deeply human that's being affirmed there that we can that we can build on, even while we want to say, you know, they're not gods. Worship isn't the appropriate category. Uh, but communion, yes, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I love that you, you said it being more materialist than it is Christian, right? And it is, mm -hmm. right? right? That that's very materialist to say, oh, you're dead. I'm sorry, you're 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 gone. That that's deeply against what you feel as a human and, and deeply against what, what's, what feels like what feels Christian. Yeah. I mean, if we believe in the resurrection, yeah, there has to be some continuity here. Like yeah. it, it can't just be a, a, a shutdown or a cutoff, you know? Yeah. So let's talk for a second about how, how this works in terms of you use underscore before, which I think is so important that this is for the saved Christian. So right. I think again, one of these tropes that, that I had as an evangelical in, in So set into in, in a, a larger framework here, I think, first of the idea that Catholics are working out their salvation, right? There's the right. mass looks like a kind of ritual, looks like they're, they're, they're praying vain or petition in the rosary. Like Catholics are doing things the Pharisees did, and it looks like they're trying to earn their salvation and their place in heaven, right? This is the kind of the, the, the common trope that evangelicals, I think, inherit in the, in the air that we would have breathed about Catholics. And so purgatory fits in this scheme as, okay, here, here go Catholics. Catholics again, right? Working out their salvation. And the idea we had was that, you know, anybody who, who died, right, could just keep on working things out and get to heaven eventually, right? I think right. you've already mentioned that, no, this is this is for the saved Christian, somebody who's died in friendship with God, right? The, the kind of the, the purification on the way to heaven. How do we understand that? Like, how do we understand that somebody has died in friendship with, with God? How do we understand who that includes? Because I, I guess... I guess I'm I'm wondering how we know who we can pray for right. in purgatory, and how and how is and I guess the other question is how is this not Catholics working something out? Like how is the Catholic not working in purgatory to get further along? Like we're right. praying for them, sure, but aren't they still working things out? Like those 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 battled Catholics are always doing. Right. I mean, the the thing about purgatory is it's it's all the language of the saints, for instance. It, I shouldn't say all, uh, all the good. <laughs> I'm sure you can find exceptions because there have been distortions <laughs> in the tradition, right? Yes. But but the 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 best part of the tradition, purgatory is perceived as very passive. You know, if you think of that metaphor I gave of Catherine of Genoa and, and the gold in the furnace, uh, the gold's not working, the furnace right, is working, right, right? Right. I mean, so so the question of you know, 
are we adding something to Christ's work here? Not at all. We are we are submitting ourselves to Christ's work, which is which is by the way any doctrine of sanctification in this life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not only the next, but it's 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 yeah. Christ Christ is the operative. Uh, you know, is the agent here. Uh, and on, on our role as the passive one, we submit ourselves to Christ's sort of ministrations, whether that's in this life or or the next. I mean, that's the struggle of the Christian life is to submit, like yeah. to get your own darn self out of the way, <laughs> right? And actually let Christ work in you. And the thing about being dead is there's less resistance. <laughs> you can, I mean, I mean, cert- certainly there's, you know, the soul retains some of its, its struggles in in the sense that they have to be overcome, but you're not like building up. You're not, let's say you're not participating in the bad habits that keep building up the stuff that make it hard to, you know, right. So you are in, in a kind of a different position. That's even more passive actually than in this life. So uh, now can you take an active sort of resistant stance? Well, let's call that hell. I mean, that, another word for it, right? Um, but if you're actually open to Christ's grace, even even just a crack, you know, uh, it's going to get in there and it's going to work. And it, it, you 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 will have to sort of submit. It, oh, there's a great short story that your listeners should should know about. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien was asked to write a short story about purgatory. Have you have you ever seen this? I haven't. It's, no, it's oh, fantastic. Oh, it's brilliant. It's called Leaf by Niggle, and <laughs> Niggle is an artist. And he paints uh, um, trees. He's painting this one tree, which is, it's actually Tolkien is telling a story about himself. And the tree is Middle Earth. And the problem is the tree is bigger than he can possibly paint, right? And it's taking over his whole house and all this kind of stuff. Well, anyways, poor Niggle gets killed in a, I think it's, is a weather incident. Like there's a, I think like a tornado hits his house or something. I haven't read it in a long time. Anyways, (laughs) You don't know right away in the story that he's been killed. He just gets sort of taken away to this place where he has to like work. And he's, but the work is not like him achieving things. It's just like him doing what he's told. So the first little while he's like shoveling some stuff or whatever. And and he just has to do it until it doesn't really bother him anymore. And then he gets to do more and more things. And it, and it becomes more and more humanized as the little habits and problems that made Niggle, you know, less than perfect are sort of weeded out and eventually he he can leave this place where it's dark and he's working and and he comes to this land where there's the tree that he'd been working on his whole life and he now sees it in three dimensions in its full glory you know and it's and it's even that's not the end yet but it's but it's it's part of the way into the greater mystery but then at the end um you go back and the, the local museum, you know, Niggle was never really a famous artist, but but someone has gathered up a couple of fragments of his work. And I'm a little, it's touching, really. There's this, there's the, the thing is called leaf by Niggle, because in the end, this is a little framed leaf, not, you know, of the whole thing he imagined, what his life could have been and what, you know, all this kind of stuff. There's this little leaf that it has its own particular charm. There's nothing quite like a leaf by niggle, you know? It's, it's just, it's it's an incredible short story. Yeah. I probably butchered it because I haven't <laughs> read it in so long. It, it's brilliant. But but the the point is, niggle undergoes something. That, that this thing that he tried to achieve his whole life, he doesn't achieve by himself in purgatory. But rather when he su- submits to what's going on in purgatory, all of a sudden there it is, right? And like, that's that's the picture, right? It's not Catholics sort of working something out, even though he he works. I'm, I'm using my scare quotes for those. He works in the sense that he does what he's told, but 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 the achievement isn't really his, you see. And that's that's the point. So, and, and just before I forget, you had asked another question about who can we pray for? Well, let's just pause here for a minute. Okay, let's I, I, I let's threw come too back many to... things on the fire there because this is okay. We gotta, we gotta sit here for a minute because that was fantastic and and that was a good retelling of the story. I have not read it. I'm going to after we get off with this podcast, this conversation. It sounds fantastic, and I think that is such a good leave it to Tolkien to give us a good picture of purgatory. <laughs> but what I, I, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the whole like that's the Catholic life, right? The the idea of just being docile to the will of God is like what we're intended to do as Catholics our entire life, right? So right. of course, all purgatory is is doing that, <laughs> like right, Un, unimpeded or or less impeded, right? Like that's. I love that picture. That's fantastic. Well, and when you said the Catholic, that's the Catholic life, you reminded me of an important element of the story that I left out, which is Nagel has a neighbor. And yeah, I mean, he has a relationship with his neighbor, but sometimes, you know, he annoys his neighbor, his neighbor annoys him and whatever. And then in purgatory, his neighbor is there and they got to figure out how to get along together. <laughs> um, and his neighbor's name of all things is Parrish. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, speaking of the Catholic life, yeah. right, like you got to figure out how to live with these people, which is actually uh, I mean, there's a Protestant quote in in that I quote in my book. And it's not it's not from a great theologian. It's from folk wisdom. And it says, like, you better figure out how to learn to live with these people now because you're going to have to spend eternity with them. Yeah. Right. And like <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, that's part of purgatory, too, is yeah. and that's part of whether you're 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 with other dead people or, or your communion with the living or whatever it is. Like it's, it's, it's a relational reality, right? The, the background for the doctrine of purgatory is the communion of saints. Yeah. Wow. You know what you, you really bring to my mind, like my, uh, my high school youth group days, right? Where I, I, that was a live question for me, right? In, in the sense of uh, uh, living with, with other people. And so often it was, the, it was the Christians that would bug us, right? <laughs> the most, like, <laughs> never mind the atheists, they don't know better, but the Christians who know better, they should be the ones that are acting appropriately and making good choices. And of course, right. I'm, lumped, I'm lumped in there, but at the time I never was, it was always everybody else's fault. But right, I, th that, that's such a, a, gosh, a good angle on this thing too, right? Just, just logically, how could I ever, right? If, if, if I were to somehow upset you, and as two Canadians, this probably isn't possible, Brett, but just imagine that <laughs> maybe one of us is American. Um, it, it, it'd be me because uh, you're, you're- I don't know. You're, you're know what? Too... We've had our rows here in Canada lately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, shouldn't, we shouldn't be- That's true. Okay. 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 <laughs> Anyways. So, so just imagine like, you know, you know if, if we have a dispute and- one of us were to die like how how could i how could i ever again weigh this magic wand and be okay seeing you in 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 heaven and being cool with like oh you know what like he whatever he, he hit my dog with this with this car and he like you know ruined ruined whatever this thing in my life but now here he is in heaven like we're all we're all good right again that the the same way that i'm not ready to to magically see christ face to face i know that i'm i'm not there in my in my in my heart of hearts, I'm not that that ready yet to, to drop these things I'm hanging on to. That relational aspect to it, that that's so important as well, right? How does there, there's got to be something there to help to repair that relationship before I just see you in, in the next in the next heartbeat, right? Right. Well, I mean, so think of think of the first encounter with another person after a falling out, right? Yeah. Right. Um, if that if that next encounter actually leads to a reintegration of communion, then you've just experienced purgatory like right there. Yeah, yeah. And, and guess what? It might've cost you a little bit. Yeah. Right. Like there might've been some suffering involved in getting over yourself enough to offer something in this really awkward situation. I mean, you've got there a very concrete uh, experience of the process that is purgatory. Now, if, if, you know, the next encounter is a doubling down on whatever led to the break in communion in the first place. Well, then you have a, a foretaste of hell. Uh, now, you're not guaranteed to stay there, right? The, the, the door is not shut yet. Um, but but you, you've been given a hint and a warning yeah. about what the end game is if you don't get things sorted out, right? Because you know, if if you are saved by God's grace, you are not holding out a grudge for eternity with somebody else. Like those two things are mutually exclusive, yeah, yeah. right? So if you're going to double down and hold on to a grudge for eternity, then the indication there is that you have not received God's grace. I mean, this is this is the logic of, I don't know how many of Jesus's parables, and certainly in the Our Father, like, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You don't get one without the other. Like that's yeah. that's bare bones Christianity right there, right? You don't get to say, I said the sinner's prayer, but you're a jerk. 
you know, like that, that you don't get to do that. Absolutely. I, I am struck by the idea. I, I recently taught this to our RCA class, the Our Father Pray went through it line by line, and I can't, my catechism is too far away to grab right now, but there's an incredible line in the catechism when it gets to this part about forgiving trespasses where it kind of says, this is really hard. And I forget the exact language, right. but yeah, yeah. it really, it, it almost steps out of itself to, to speak like just so honestly and like, I don't get this. And I read that and I thought, wow, like this, like, you know, the church officially just don't, you know, just doesn't get this. It's hard and complicated. This idea of we have to forgive others to be, to be forgiven. Like that's a complicated and difficult thing to understand and, and to wrestle with. But yes, like how could you, how could you, Yes. How could you be in heaven in eternity with, with somebody that you, you haven't forgiven? Like there's, yeah, it so, again, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so I learned something from a, a Protestant scholar. So w- if you read the book, the fourth chapter is an engagement with the thought of Miroslav Volf, who's yeah. one of the more important evangelical theologians working today. And he didn't, he didn't have a doctrine of purgatory, but he had a doctrine of the last judgment. And that's why the title of the book uh, can can Catholics and evangelicals agree about purgatory and the last judgment? Because he says at the last judgment, all of all everything's going to be sort of aired, you know, it, like every every stone will be turned over, nothing nothing will be hidden, right? Um, everything will be brought to light, and that's going to actually have implications for both perpetrators and victims. Right. So if you think about purgatory as okay, you've committed some sins. And you need to sort of work out whatever that's done in your soul for you to be fit for heaven. You've also been sinned against. And you might have to work that out too because because resentment's not allowed in heaven either. Right. And so at the last judgment in Wolf's image of it, you have perpetrators uh, who are forgiven, but only when it's been made crystal clear what damage they actually did right they're gonna have to look their victims in the face and they're gonna know what what their their transgressions amounted to uh and then the forgiveness is that's not cheap grace right you're gonna like that's you're gonna know exactly so so a picture jesus telling you what harm you've done and then also embracing you right that kind of (laughs) move but then the flip side is the victim is watching Jesus embrace the perpetrator. All right. What is that? So I just heard from a Ukrainian Catholic priest who was preaching after the invasion uh, a month or two ago, right? And he said, if you get to heaven and you see Vladimir Putin in heaven, you don't say, God, what are you doing? You say, or you don't say like, what is he doing here? You say, I am amazed at the grace of God. (laughs) <laughs> right like and so right it, that the victim it, you can't stay in your victim status for eternity either and try to hold on to some claim on somebody else and this actually this shows up in the great divorce in a couple of the stories of yeah. the great divorce is that the person who wants to hold on to the wrongdoing because their identity has become the one who was wronged and so they can't let go of that and heaven won't abide that either so healing is so, Purgatory is both healing for the victim and justice for the perpetrator. And then here's the kicker. You're not one or the other. You're actually both, right? You are a perpetrator and a victim. And that's true of virtually all of us. I mean, you might think up some example of, you know, some, some child who was killed before they were of the age of reason or, you know, something like that. But the, but the normative circumstances were all perpetrators and were all victims. And both of those things require, justice and healing right oh <laughs> that's fantastic this is really good stuff brett <laughs> well okay. thank miroslav volf for that one i mean <laughs> yeah. i learned a lot from him and this is a broader point about uh ecumenical dialogue is yeah. i'm a catholic who believes in purgatory and i learned from a protestant how to better articulate the insights of purgatory even though he doesn't claim to believe in purgatory yeah right so we don't need these sort of mutually exclusive silos like i learned a lot from miroslav wolf that i think catholics can take forward so that they better understand and articulate their own teaching yeah 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 well said okay so i asked before too we'll go back to this now but maybe it's too big of a question maybe the question is who's saved which is a large question to try and tackle on this on 
on, on one episode of the podcast, never mind one question on an, on an episode of the podcast. Right, but right. Who, how do we know? I mean, how do we know uh, who to pray for in purgatory? Who's there? Who might be there? We know it saved, we know, you know, it saved Christians, broadly speaking. But I mean, how do we know if, can, I don't know, maybe the question is better, is better said, can we pray for the wrong person in purgatory? Like, can we right. pray for somebody who's not in purgatory? What, what happens then? Like, what do we, you know what I mean? I think those are practical questions we, we wrestle with. We don't always right. know where our loved ones or people have gone. Right? Yeah. So, I, no, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I think it, it does, in the end, reduce the, the question of who is saved, which is a big question. Um, but but let me just say what the church says about this. They ne- the church never defines that anyone is in hell, right? Right. So you don't you don't know. You know some right. You don't need to pray for Saint Mary. I mean, this is the adorable thing in children's liturgy, right? When you pray <laughs> when you pray with the kids and they pray for Jesus and they pray they for always, Mary, and you're they like, always do. yeah, yeah I, they always pray for Jesus and Mary, and you're like, okay, I'm not going to correct that. I'm just going to you know I'm going to let that go. But here's 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 the lesson in that, right? Even if there's no good that their prayer for Jesus is going to do for Jesus, the reason why we don't stop them is because we recognize the good it does for them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> there, there's something they're cultivating in their soul by this, this misplaced, if you want to call it that, prayer for Jesus. It's love for Jesus that they're cultivating. Well, I'm not going to, you know, rain on that parade, right? So 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 then let's let's think about the the reverse right let's think about praying for someone who might not be saved well first of all you don't know if they're saved and the church is very clear that you don't know if they're saved and that you're no you're in no position to judge and when you pray i mean you can pray in general terms you can pray for the holy souls in purgatory well then you know even if you can't number them yourself you're directing it in a general way if you pray for those who have no one to pray for them or you know there's different ways of making general statements but let's say you know, just for sake of argument, that you pray for someone and in fact they are in hell and they are rejecting God's grace and every effort you make to open them to God's grace. Um, my, okay, I don't want to be too flippant, but like, <laughs> so what? Like, are are you becoming a more charitable person by praying for them? Like, is 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 it a waste? Can God not use your good intentions in, in his plan for the salvation of the world, that individual may or may not have opted out. But but God isn't like, stop wasting your time on that Yahoo and pray for this other guy, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, we don't we don't know if anyone is damned or, or or the identity of the damned at all. And the church, I think the church is very wise to not do that. I mean, just, just imagine if we had the opposite of canonized saints. If we had a list of people in hell that like <laughs> that we can all feel superior to because yeah. we're better than they are. Right. Like that's spiritually very dangerous. So I think the church is very wise to not play that game. Um, but like, yeah, I, 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 I see like no downside to praying for anybody. I, you know what I mean? Like, is it a waste of your time? No, because you're cultivating something in your own soul. You're cultivating compassion you're cultivating um, openness and sympathy and whatever. But that's gonna that's a transferable skill, man. Like you take that into your own life, you take that into prayers for others, right? So, yeah, I, I I'm just not worried about like wasting prayers on people. Goodness sake, how many people might you pray for who are alive right now who might end up damned? Is was were all those prayers a waste because they didn't work? You know, I mean. No, those, I mean, people are free and they, they, they can reject the grace that you're trying to be a part of communicating to them, whether you're telling them about the gospel or praying for them or, or anything else you might be doing for them in this life. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop doing it just because that in their freedom, they might reject it. And so I don't see why in the afterlife, it's any different. Yeah, that, that's, that's very well said. Yeah. I'm thinking of those people that I pray for now that, I mean, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the same it's the same thing yeah that that makes that makes total sense what about the the timey wimey nature of prayer i mean 
What if the idea, like, I mean, I, I just love the idea that, you know, God is outside of time. And so prayer can be applied kind of anywhere and, and, and everywhere, right? I can pray for somebody uh, and, and I don't know, they could have died lots of long time ago and have are now technically out of purgatory. Again, right. using, using air quotes. Right. My prayers aren't wasted because they can apply back and, and reverse that person at the time when they needed them most, right? Like, can we talk about that for a minute? Because I think that's really interesting. The, the nature of, of, of time and purgatory and how our prayers can kind of transcend time in general. Like, right. I think that's so fascinating because again, you mentioned this before too, in, in passing, that there is not necessarily this chronological time we can count in purgatory in the same way that, in the same way that, that, you know, if I pray for them right now, that prayer is, is rocketed to them directly right now. It's not, it's, it's this weird timey wimey thing. Timey wimey. Yeah. Can, 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 can yeah. Yeah. No. There for a minute. It, yeah. It's a great question. So some Protestants, this is interesting, especially Anglicans and Lutherans will often include prayers for the dead at the funeral and then not anymore. Right. So you commend the dead to God. And then the, the, the criticism of Catholics is like, what, you didn't think that worked? <laughs> like, why, why do you need to keep doing it? You know, like we commended them to God at the funeral we think they're good to go now, like ease off. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, if a Catholic is praying because they don't think it worked, well, that, you know, that would, that would raise real questions. But if, if the, the prayer is like, look, this is a process. Um, I don't know where they're at in the process or what they need, but God does. And they're not, neither they nor God is bound by time the way I am. And so um, the application of whatever grace comes from it, even if, and remember, grace isn't magic, right? Even if it's the grace of like knowing I'm not forgotten or the grace of knowing this person I personally hurt is not holding a grudge. God can apply that when and where as, you know, as, as is appropriate. I mean, it's even possible. I, I don't know. I mean, I, this is highly speculative, right? But, and, and it, and it barely works because we're talking about time frames that are, you know, so limiting in, in, for our imagination. But like, what if there's some information that a person does not need right now, right? Until they're at some further stage of growth, but you offer it in prayer. And God's like, you know what, that, that step C and we're working on step A right now. So we're just going to hang on to that for a minute, right? I mean, it's highly speculative, but it's and it's it, <laughs> but it it tells you something about grace, right? That that this is a process and it's not a sort of um uh it's not magic, it's not when you say the prayer this many years come off or whatever. It's that the prayers have to work the way prayers work and grace has to work the way grace works and God can manage that situation and that process and put your prayers to use as, as, as they best suit. You know what I mean? Um, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis talks about, and this is in Letters to Malcolm too, I think, about the punishments of purgatory, right? And he's like, the point isn't whether they're big or small. Uh, you know, big sins get this punishment, small sins get that. Well, and like, that's, the point is whether they work. Right? They're not, they're not arbitrary. They're, they're, they're supposed to do something. And so if, you know, if a dentist needs to pull a tooth, well, the point isn't that you need to cause this much pain or avoid that much pain. The point is you got to get rid of the tooth. Yeah. And, and that's the, what we call punishments in purgatory. Uh, that too is metaphorical language, by the way. Right. Um, they're a treatment that, that, hurts as much or as little as it needs to. Uh, Cause the point is the healing, not the, not the pain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great point. I love that. Let me ask you one last question as we wrap, the, wrap up this conversation, uh, Brett. It's been fantastic to have you back on the show. This Whoa, question, it's flown by. This, it's been an hour. <laughs> Holy smoke! When you're okay. having fun, like this is this is purgatory time. It just it's it's outside. You know, it's there you go. It, it's timey wimey, as yeah, you put it. It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> this question I heard somewhere. I can't quite put my finger on where I heard this question, but here it is: Can Catholics and evangelicals agree about purgatory and the last judgment? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Let me say, I will never again have a book with a title that long. <laughs> uh, I, I pitched that title to the publisher and, uh, and it, 
they accepted it and I was wrong because it's way too long. <laughs> uh, people always joke with me that the answer uh, is shorter than the question. You know? <laughs> and they mean, no, they can't, you know. Um, and so my next book, I promised it would be a one word title and it was the transubstantiation book. Yeah. Now you get a subtitle, but the title is one word, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they can. I think they can. But 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 let me offer some some detail on that, right? So it involves clearing away misunderstanding, which is a lot of what I try to do in the book. It involves a recognition that we're using different conceptual tools, different images, different metaphors to try to talk about the same process. And that's why I put Purgatory and the Last Judgment in the, in the title together. Because what I found in Miroslav Volf's theology of the Last Judgment was a really satisfying answer to the question that Catholics are answering with the doctrine of purgatory. And we don't need to say, oh, purgatory is wrong because of Wolf's theology of the last judgment, or we don't need Wolf's theology of the last judgment because we already have purgatory. Like they're mutually illuminating. They they help us to understand what's going on uh, in, in either case, right? And so I think if if we're willing to listen to each other and, and sort of clear away the misunderstanding, Catholics need to admit that the, the doctrine was abused, that it, yeah. it both for monetary purposes, but also that it that is tied up with various superstitions, it has been uh, at different times in church history, and that the core of the, the teaching of the church is not those things. And then and then Protestants need to be able to, to also grant that, right? Like you're not it's not fair to judge people by their their worst failings of living up to their own aspiration. It's not fair to judge the aspiration by the worst failings, right? right? Like yeah, yeah. judge it by what it claims to be. Um, even if we can all agree that it, it hasn't been lived up to. Um, I think I think the basic insight of purgatory is natural and intuitive in a Christian worldview. If you believe in heaven and hell, if you believe in the communion of the saints, if you believe in a doctrine of sanctification where grace doesn't work like magic, if you believe all those things, purgatory makes sense. It, are there dangers to be avoided in terms of misunderstanding? There always are. And we can always learn more and, and being humble and submitting ourselves to honest questions from non-Catholics of goodwill uh, can, can help, right? We, we can better understand and clarify what the church has, has been teaching here. Um, so there's work to be done, uh, that, that kind of work. Um, but I think when it's done, it's certainly possible. And you know what? Do we need to call it by the same thing? I'm not picky about that. <laughs> right? I mean, if, if an evangelical doesn't want to call what I call purgatory, purgatory, but they're willing to grant that prayer for the dead is not like idolatry, and they're willing to acknowledge that, that God, uh, you know, continues working on us, uh, in a way that's not magical, but in a way that is consistent with what we know about God's grace in the process of sanctification here. Uh, and that there, and that there are elements of mystery here that we don't need to nail down precisely in order to be in communion with one another or to not consider each other heretics. I mean, with all that in place, can we agree? Yeah, I think we can. <laughs> Well said. Well said. I love that. I was going to say they can call it Walmart if they want to. If they want to call it Perto, they can call it Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I could go. I mean, almost any trial in our lives is could is purgatory, right? If if you had a trial in Walmart, if that was, if you allowed that trial to make you more holy rather than less, it was purgatory. Yeah. <laughs> That was fantastic. Uh, Brett, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. It was too long this time. I'll make sure it's less time next time. Um, where do you want to point listeners towards to uh, hear more of you? You have, a, you have a podcast. I'll put links to these books in the show notes too. Where, what, what, should, where do you want to point them towards? Where should they go? Yeah, so check out the podcast, Thinking Faith, available anywhere you get your podcast. We got like hundreds of back episodes. It comes out every Tuesday uh, for like, what? like five years now, something like that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so check out the podcast. Uh, if you just put my name into YouTube search engine, you'll find I've been, in, I don't have, my own channel is like three things, but <laughs> if, if you see, I've been interviewed on a bunch of different uh, YouTube channels. Um, you can get my books 
uh, anywhere you get books. Uh, I, I recommend supporting your local Catholic or Christian bookstore if you can, or ordering from the publisher, because uh, that helps publishers and authors to make enough money to actually keep doing their work, whereas buying from places like Amazon typically does not. Uh, so I encourage you, if it's possible, to get, get books uh, in those kind of places. Um, where else? I have another book coming out in the fall for Catholic teachers called Educating for Eternity. Uh, and, oh, here's here's an announcement that I haven't made anywhere. Oh so boy. get okay. ready for this I'm one. Ready. Uh, I'm uh, starting a monthly column. It will be carried in our Sunday Visitor, which is a weekly paper in the United States, Catholic weekly paper, and hopefully carried in many other places as well. Uh, probably starting in June or July, I will have a monthly column, and there will be places on the internet where you can find it. I mean, it'll be in the print version, but it'll also be on our Sunday Visitor's website. Oh, and, and then I've written things for Church Life Journal, Word on Fire, our Sunday Visitor, um, so if you just Google, you know, you'll find, you'll find all those kinds of things. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Hey, congrats on the column. That sounds awesome. Thank you. Do you have a name yeah. for it yet? Uh, I, <laughs> this could change, but I'm it's strongly, the question. <laughs> I'm strongly leaning towards calling it faith seeking understanding. Okay. Which is St. Anselm's classic definition of theology. Okay. I was thinking something like, like, like Sockled says or something, but, uh, well, so I put out a call on Facebook for people to give me like potential names. And I just got two hilarious ones today. My wife, uh, said, use your favorite uh, scripture verse. Now your favorite funny scripture verse, not, not your favorite, you know, serious. <laughs> and it's who told you that you were naked, which I think is a delightful, <laughs> uh, verse. And then, uh, and then a, a cousin of mine made a play on my initials and said I should call it a bunch of BS. <laughs> that's, been, oh, that's fantastic. I love it. We'll, we'll look for those. We'll look for that lovely comment uh, our Sunday visitor when it comes out. And I'll link to all your stuff in the show notes. Uh, Brett, always a pleasure to have you on the show. It's very fun. Thank you for being here. I want to say God bless you and the work you're doing for the church. And thanks so much for being on our show again this week. It was a delight. Happy happy to come back whenever whenever you'd like. All right, see you tomorrow. <laughs>